Uh, now I want to quickly go through the integration. And for the full integration elements, yeah, okay, this is basically where they started because um, they are basically defined by the minimum um, number you, um, necessary to accurately or exactly depict the strain energy for an undistorted element with linear material properties. You say, yeah, come on. D distorted elements with nonlinear material properties is what we actually are interested. Yes, so you're right um, that only for this certain, for some special cases, the full integration elements are of real benefit, I would say. This is um, why nowadays reduced integration um, has become the default. You see that the default element in Abacus usually is the first order reduced integration element, which tells you, okay, now Abacus nowadays uses actually the most simple um, element for many applications and it would usually ask you to um, increase the mesh den density because over time we have evolved to the point where this is, so to say, the industry standard. Um, in general, you can say that the element stiffness is used only the reduced number of integration points. However, the mass matrix and loadings distributed over the elements are still calculated using the full number. So it's interesting that just by um, using the reduced number of integration points actually can save you quite a lot of time. So because the element stiffness um, often is the most extensive to um, build. So they now, you, sometimes back in the days, they even used for mass and the loadings a lower order integration, but they found out that this is not so smart to do. So they switched back and say, okay, we use this only for the element stiffness. So in general, you can say it's completely uh, faster. Um, in the higher the dimension you go, um, the more you save. Um, comparing um, first order reduced integration, um, so that would like this one, um, uh, with second order reduced integration, you can generally say that yes, second order integration elements, reduced integration elements, yield more accurate results. It would be weird if they wouldn't because they just can contain more information. Um, but the accuracy you can achieve with first order elements um, depends heavily on the nature of your problem. So it might, I can, I would say, yeah, I would say that in many, many cases, the difference between a first order um, reduced integration and a second order reduced integ integration, in many cases, you, will, you can hardly tell the difference. If you have a sufficiently accurate mesh, so if you have a very poor mesh quality, yes, you can have much better results using the same number of elements uh, going second order. Okay, the, one of the first aspects of, I would say, smart meshing um, I want to talk about is the effect of hourglassing. You might have heard about it, you might have not. So what does it mean? It is, um, it is a problem, that's for sure. And it occurs in first order reduced integration element. And now you say, oh my God, this is a default. Uh, from Abacus, and especially in 3D, it's the so-called cedar element. Um, this is the default, and this shows hourglassing. Um, then you ask yourself, okay, why does Abacus choose an element with such a problem as a default? Um, but they have come up with some smart countermeasures. So what is hourglassing, actually? You see, um, I found a picture um, here that hopefully explains what's going on. It's basically if you have um, a moment, um, maybe as a result from a bending process, that acts compressive on the top and um, tensile on the bottom, you create um, a strain state 
at which the center line, the vertical center line and the horizontal um, center line um, are unchanged in length. So the integration point in the middle says, yeah, okay, um, I see zero strain, however, the nodes have changed their position. Um, so that is a problem that, as you can now understand, only why it's only occurring in reduced order, uh, in first order reduced integration elements. And I've um, given here some example how this looks. For example, our glassing uh, evolves more from the left to the right, and here you see uh, here you see a typical example why this is called our glassing. Um, this can occur in multi occasions, so it's it's hard to tell when this will actually um, start to occur. So it's definitely more likely to occur um, under bending if you do not have a sufficient number of elements through thickness. So usually you say at least four is a um, uh, good number to start with. As you can see here on the right, that looks better. You don't see this wavy pattern at the bottom. Um, and you can also say that um, if you apply point-wise loads um, or nodal boundary conditions, you will increase the likelihood that this happens. So for example, if you would apply a load on this um, particular node, um, yes, you can, let's just say, increase um, the likelihood of this um, starting to happen. So always check at the end of your simulation, um, check your mesh in terms of hourglassing, because this can have, um, this can cause um, the simulation to abort um, prematurely, so that you have convergence issues that you have some artificial stresses emerging that are caused by adjacent elements um, showing hourglassing. You don't want all of this because this is unphysical. This is purely due to the nature of first order reduced integration element and since this is the standard, um, watch out for it. Usually you can check the enhanced hourglass control and Abacus claims that Changing it's computationally a little bit more costly than the default option. Um, however, Abacus claims that you won't have any hourglassing if you choose the enhanced hourglass control for your first order reduced integration element. Okay.